nights of old celebrated special days. And we celebrate special days today. This morning we will be talking about independence, a day that we're all familiar with. Each year we celebrate a number of holidays. We start the year off with New Year's and a New Year's Eve celebration. We celebrate the birthday of famous individuals, set aside special days to recognize the accomplishments of others. There are holidays that, while not all formally recognized as holidays, nevertheless, we celebrate them as such. The Super Bowl, World Series, Stanley Cup, and other sports championships are celebrated days. We have religious holidays that we all can't agree upon. We have Labor Day, Memorial Day, holidays for Thanksgiving, and many more. We have days that we as individuals and small groups also celebrate. Birthdays of family, friends, graduations, personal achievements, and yes, days that mark tragedy in our lives. Each of these special days all have one thing in common. On some level, even for just a short time, our minds become independent of our routine activities. And our thoughts and emotions are allowed to take us to a different level outside of our everyday existence. We feel a certain amount of freedom or independence on these special days. For the most part, we are actually celebrating the achievements of others. Achievements that you and I benefit from and take pride in. We celebrate a lot of holidays. One such holiday is that what we call the 4th of July, Independence Day. That's tomorrow. We celebrate the achievement of others in the adoption and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In its signing, this country became free from the rule of Great Britain, and independence was achieved. It's a national holiday recognizing someone else's achievement. We benefit and take pride in that achievement. We have parades, fireworks, carnivals, barbecues, ball games, and much more. Someone else's achievement, but nonetheless, it is our Independence Day. This day or time is often characterized as a singular moment in time that was heard around the world. Independence Day, free from something and free to something. Yes, it was heard around the world, but it was not offered to all who heard it. Many under the oppressive hand remain so. Only the hand of the oppressor has changed. The lesson learned is that man's so-called independence is limited. It is not offered to all. Another lesson is that man's independence is temporary. Nothing that comes by man is permanent. Also, the lesson taught is that man's independence is not true independence. The physical man will always remain a slave to the rules and the limits of this world. We speak of the 4th of July as our Independence Day, but there is another day of independence, a day of limitless independence. There is no one who is not offered this independence, a day of permanent independence, because it does, does not come by man. A day of true independence because it transcends this physical existence with all of this world's rules and regulations. We are born into this world and are slaves of sin and suffering whose prince is that of darkness and hell. Satan himself, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 22. Under his oppressive hand, man will never be free. Under his hand, we will never enjoy the independence that the spirit of man yearns for. Under his hand, we will never have the liberty to pursue godly things such as truth, 
love, and eternal life. Only God himself can free us from Satan's oppressive hand. God loves us. And because of his love for mankind, he offered us another independence day. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 32 reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled this promised new covenant through his sacrificial work on the cross. We commemorate his work upon the cross each Lord's day during communion, just as we have just done. Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and 1 Corinthians 11. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This day is the day of the cross, when God sent his son to die for our sins, to pay the price to set us free from the oppressive hand of Satan. The Bible has only one message, the cross. Paul said, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. We love God's Word, yet we must give greater diligence to studying it and living it. While we wear the cross's jewel and use it on our signs, it is meant to be worn on the heart. The cross brought the death of Jesus. It was gory, bloody, and heart-wrenching. Every human being must come to know Christ and his cross. It is the glory of all who are saved. As we study the scriptures, they lead us to the foot of the cross, where salvation is found. Yes, the cross brought the death of Jesus. It also brought freedom and independence to mankind. Not only was this a singular event heard around the world at that time, but also throughout time itself with the effect going back to the beginning of creation and into eternity. Sin is one of the main topics of the Bible. God gave the law to Moses to make people aware of sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Jew was right in Luke chapter 5 and verse 21 in Mark chapter 2 and verse 7 when he said, Who can forgive sins but God alone. With man, the problem of sin is insurmountable. Sin cannot be covered up. Sin cannot be ignored. And sin cannot be discarded. Sin can only be forgiven. Man cannot save himself, but God can. And he will do so. But it is only through the cross that we can access his righteousness and gain his pardon. Away from God, sinners are dead in their sin. Away from God, we are dead in our sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 reads, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. In other words, by grace, we have been saved. Away from God, there is no freedom. 
There is no independence from sin. Jesus did not go to the cross to die for our hurts or our acts. He died for our sins. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 reads, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we come to the cross, we are washed in his blood that fell from his side. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, chapter 7 and verse 14, and also Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 19. We can leave our sins at the foot of the cross, or we can take them with us to hell for eternity. We have a choice. We have all heard the saying that the more things change, the more they say stay the same. Down through time, cultures change, but people remain the same. The idea of independence is not a new one. The book of Exodus relates to us the same wants and needs of a people long ago that echo the wants and needs of all people today. People want self-power over themselves and not under the control of others. Political power to choose their own leaders. Power to make moral decisions and not be forced to succumb to the wishes of others. And to be free from fatalism. That feeling that today is just like yesterday and tomorrow will be just like today. All people want and need hope. Exodus is a story of freedom and independence. The Israelites lived in Egypt for over 400 years, becoming slaves under the yoke of Egyptian bondage. Turn to the book of Exodus if you have your Bibles. Exodus chapter 3. Here we find the story of a loving God in action. Moses is on the mountain of God at the burning bush, starting with verse number 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taxes. For I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. The God of long ago is the same God that hears our cries and knows our sorrows. Our oppression is that of sin, and our taskmaster is the devil himself. God watches over us today as he did in the long ago. But God is not just a watcher. He is a doer. Verse number 8 says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. God acted on behalf of the Israelites, and God has acted on our behalf also through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we look forward to an eternal land of milk and honey. David wrote in Psalms 40 about how troubles and difficulties lead us to lean upon the Lord. Verses number 1 through 3 reads as follows. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up from the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. When we have trouble and difficulties, who do we turn to? Who pulls us up out of the miry clay? Who establishes our steps on solid foundations? Who can we turn to but to the Lord? Psalms 28 verse number 7 reads, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy. It took some of the Israelites 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to come to that realization. Many today live a lifetime in bondage to sin, like a pig in slop, content, but of little value until the slop is removed. 
This requires help for the pig and help for the man. Verse number 12 says, So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. God is with us because of what Jesus did for us upon the cross. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans chapter 8, verse number 16. At the cross there is freedom and independence from sin. It no longer has dominion over us. It also means that there is freedom and independence from God's wrath. We talk about God's love, but we don't talk about his wrath. We put on blinders when it comes to punishment. We don't think about it because we really don't want it to exist. We forget that a holy God is also a God of wrath. The word wrath is used in the Bible even more than grace. We cringe at the word, but without wrath, there would be no need for grace. God has wrath. God has fierce wrath. God has great wrath. And God has a day of wrath. Love demands wrath. But wrath is appeased by love. Love restrains wrath, but it does not destroy it. At the cross, we have found freedom and independence from God's wrath. It comes through the love of the Father and the blood of the Son. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, and without blame, before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted and beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Limitless independence offered to all. Permanent independence that can never be taken away. True independence, transcending all earthly limitations. Yes, at the cross, the blood of Jesus freely flowed. The centerpiece of the Bible is the blood of Jesus. People have always been horrified by the subject of blood. Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, Leviticus chapter 17, and verse 11 read that life is in the blood, and every man has blood. If a man bleeds and it is not stopped, he will bleed to death. If you don't believe it, try it. The Bible also tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, and verse number 20. Blood is necessary for life, and blood is necessary for the remission of sin. Paul, in his address to the men of Athens, Acts chapter 17 and verse number 26, it reads, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their life. We are all of one blood and uh, of one life. Each and every one of us carries all of the attributes of each and every person who ever walked or will walk upon this earth. Each man is part of all men, and on the cross the blood which flows from our Savior is the same blood that flows in the veins of mankind. God gives life to this blood, which comes to us without sin, and when we defile it, he removes his eternal life from it. The only way to be restored of this eternal life is at the foot of the cross, where God's only begotten Son suffered, bled, and died while shedding his blood for our sins. We need the blood which flowed from our Savior while hanging on the cross, providing us this opportunity 
to be free and independent of sin. There is power in his blood, and the great physician stands ready and willing to give all who come to him a transfusion. This blood can only be found at the foot of the cross. Christ, having shed his blood for the remission of our sins, identifies us with the Holy Spirit, who then strengthens us through the word and assists us in the battle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Again, Ephesians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. There is power in the blood, power to give us freedom, power to give us independence, power over sin. Yes, we celebrate this day our true independence day. We celebrate the achievement of someone else for our benefit, our pride, our peace, and our salvation. The blood of Jesus is at the foot of the cross. We need the blood of Jesus. We want the blood of Jesus. We are cleansed in the blood of Jesus. We are stained by the blood of Jesus. We have freedom and independence from the prince of this world through the blood of Jesus. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. We are saved from the wrath of God by the blood of Jesus. We have an eternal life through the blood of Jesus. And we should never allow ourselves or those that we come in contact to forget. Dr. Martin Luther King, three months before the assassination <coughs> of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, delivered his I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. The backdrop of his speech was that of jobs and freedom of an oppressed people. This speech is credited for prompting the 1964 Civil Rights Act a day of independence. While the goal is admirable, it is still a plea. Independence was not offered to all men, it's limited. This independence is not permanent. Nothing that man does is permanent. This independence is not true independence. All are still bound to the rules and the limits of this world and the influence of the Prince of God. Dr. Martin Luther King uttered great words that day of August 28, 1963. Words written in history books, words quoted by many throughout this nation, words that represent high and lofty ideals. This was a great day. Yet when placed alongside the day of the cross, these words take on new meaning, a deeper meaning, a universal meaning, a permanent meaning, and a true meaning. A meaning that could only come from Almighty God Himself. Dr. Martin Luther King uttered the words, but God through Christ's blood gives him new meaning. These words are free at last. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty that we are free at last. Every first day of the week, we and others like us assemble to celebrate our true Independence Day the day of the cross. Our Savior gave his life-shedding blood, not just for a few, but for whosoever shall call upon him and obey him. What he gives us can never be taken away. John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30 reads, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than I, and greater than all. And he and I are one. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand. A permanent independence that can't be taken away. It can only be given away through disobedience. 
This independence is true because it comes down from the Father. It transcends this earthly existence. This is the lifelong independence and should be celebrated each and every day that God allows us to walk upon the face of the earth. Each day that we arise, we should utter the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, but with a new understanding, a deeper appreciation, a spiritual need, and with a growing love for the one who shed his blood to make it possible. Free at last. 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 Thank God Almighty that because of the blood shed on the cross by my Savior, I, we, can be free at last. In conclusion, these are wonderful words, powerful words, earthly words with a heavenly meaning. You've heard these words. That through faith in what was accomplished on the day of the cross, the accomplishment of another, that you and I can be partakers of the gift of our Savior, which he offers to all through the shedding of his blood. There is but one question to be asked. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? If you do, then your back is clear. You must obey and do as those who did on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 37. When they asked men, his brother, what shall we do? Then Peter said, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And during this baptism, you will contact the life-giving blood of Jesus cleansing you from your sin and opening the door to eternal life. If you have already contacted the blood of Jesus and have turned your back on it, you can make it right by confessing your fault and asking for forgiveness. Or else, if you are just in need of prayer, if any of these is your desire, come down to the front, give your heart to God, place your hand in mine, we will pray together. Do so as the rest of us stand and sing the song of encouragement. Oh, do.